Have you ever wondered how COVID-19 might be silently affecting your heart? Dive into today's episode where we're going to unravel the mysteries of the virus's impact on cardiovascular health and how a functional medicine approach may be your secret weapon to protecting your health. Welcome to the Hashimoto's Doctor Podcast. You're now part of a growing community of people determined to take their health back through education and self-empowerment. But because of the healthcare system today, we don't have access to the types of healthcare that we want. So we have to do things differently. We've got to do things smarter, and we do that by becoming our own advocates. This podcast will give you the perspective and thoughts of one of the world's leading Hashimoto's doctors. So let's get started. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Hashimoto's Doctor Podcast. I'm your host, Brad Shook, and today we're going to be talking about a topic that's been in the media quite a bit and some new research that comes out that further explains and is giving us some clarity on how COVID-19 may be impacting our cardiovascular health. And if you're really you know, someone that has cardiovascular disease or if you've had some problems with your cardiovascular system and you suspect that it might be related to COVID, then you're going to want to join us for this episode. First, let's set the stage. Many of you have heard that COVID-19, which is caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus, it's primarily known as a respiratory disease. But recent research just published in September of 2023, shed some light on its potential cardiovascular implications. The virus, interestingly, I thought this was really fascinating because we've heard about the potential for the virus to contribute to blood clotting. And this research is fascinating because what they discovered and identified was that the virus can directly target arterial plaques in our coronary arteries, leading to inflammation, and then that creates a lot of problems for us. And the coronary arteries, I mean, these are the the arteries around the heart. And this is is a really important issue and, and topic that leads to and gives us more information about how COVID could contribute to heart attacks and uh, other problems with our cardiovascular system. Because if the virus can infect the actual plaques, if you have any pre-existing arterial plaquing, which many of us do, then the virus can actually infect that plaque and leading leading to inflammation there in that local area. Now, this is obviously a real problem, and it's important because this inflammation can set off a chain of reactions that could potentially lead to heart attacks and even obstruction of blood flow. Here's where this gets even more intriguing. The more that I learn about SARS-CoV-2, you know, the more you know, fascinated and really horrified I am by this virus because we've seen so many potential side effects and there, there are so many reports of varied side effects that could affect women and, you know, potentially linked to uh, the development of cancers and, and, and many other side effects that have continuously been reported, you know, none of which have been uh, really researched with any kind of depth. And this virus, you know, it, there's been research that has shown that antigens or uh, antibodies against different parts of the virus itself may contribute to the uh, initiation of autoimmune conditions. And when you, you look at this virus, there, it just has you know, so many potential mechanisms for really interfering with human health. And I mean, we know that a lot of viruses that we're more familiar with, like Epstein-Barr virus, for example, that they have the potential to either be triggers or perpetuators of the autoimmune disease process and that they can, uh, you, know, you know, they have a lot of different mechanisms to interfere with our health. And we are still learning about the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And it is, um, you know, it's fascinating. And, and again, it's, it's also horrifying because there are so many potential ways that it could, you know, you know interrupt and disturb and affect our health long term. So, one of the things, you know, in particular that this piece of research has has showed us is that the virus can can actually infect 
arterial placking in the coronary arteries. And this is just, you know, as far as I know, this has never been shown in any other research where the virus can actually infect the plaque of the coronary arteries, which are, you know, the coronary arteries supply the heart. And when that occurs, it creates an inflammatory response, like right around those plaques and in those arteries, which is obviously of major concern because the inflammatory response in and of itself could lead to more placking or maybe a dislodging of plaque and contribute to some real significant problems, you know, heart attacks or, um, you know, embolisms where you get a, a piece of the plaque that breaks free and then can travel uh, to throughout the circulatory system until it becomes lodged somewhere, uh, you know, uh, cutting off blood flow. And, and this is, you know, this is just really, you know, again, fascinating and horrifying at the same time. But I think it's really important that we have these discussions because there are things that you can do about it. Now, it's also important to understand that, that obviously if the virus can infect these plaques, then if you know that you already have some degree of arterial placking, then you need to be, you know, more aware of this. And from, you know, from my perspective and, and what I think is that, you, you know, if you know that you have heart disease or if you have a history of heart disease in your family, that this would be even more, uh, you know, you know, a more important reason to make sure that you're getting you're getting screened. You're getting uh, you're getting checked to see if you have any type of arterial placking or uh, risk for cardiovascular disease. If you've had COVID, especially because this is something that could actually contribute to lingering problems. Not just it's not just around the acute infection when you you know you first get COVID and you're symptomatic. This could be something that is actually persistent. And this is this is really tied to the persistence of the inflammatory response after COVID is you know, the acute infection has passed. And if, you know, if you're wondering if this has anything to do with long COVID, you're, you're spot on because the inflammatory environment can linger. And this is something that could, you know, potentially lead to continuous plaque growth and then potentially obstructed blood flow to these, you know, to our, the organs and tissues of our body. This all ties into long COVID because you know, th through many potential mechanisms here, but the inflammatory response in particular of, of the virus can have multiple systemic effects. And a lot of adults that have recovered from COVID-19, they report all kinds of symptoms. I mean, the, the probably the most common symptom that I have heard with people that have had COVID is fatigue. And then I would say probably followed closely by difficulty thinking or concentrating. And then uh, I would say probably third would be GI symptoms, like they actually have problems with their gut and their digestion. And this is, you know, this is something that I talked about in another podcast. Uh, it's a pretty in-depth podcast on the virus's potential role in impacting the gut microbiome and how that can, that disruption of the gut microbiome can lead to more, uh, more inflammatory issues because your gut and the, the relationship of your digestive tract and your bacteria in your gut to your immune system and your inflammatory response is a, a really important one. You know, I work a lot with auto, people that are autoimmune. And by the way, one of the ways that a lot of these long COVID symptoms are starting to be looked at and, and that uh, they think that they may be best supported is through an autoimmune model. And that's, you know, that's really interesting because it seems to be, you know, uh, immune mediated. A lot of this is being driven by uh, persistent immune issues. So the, and anytime you're working with autoimmunity, you have to really closely consider what's happening in the, in the gut and the health of the intestinal lining, because that is a selectively permeable immune barrier system. That's not just like your digestive tract. It is, it is, it is your digestive tract is more than just where, you know, your food digests and, and you absorb food and there are bacteria present. This is actually a selectively permeable. So it lets things through that should get through and keeps things in the digestive tract that shouldn't get into your bloodstream barrier system. And this barrier system, if it's compromised, can lead to a massive immune response. Because again, it's an immune barrier. Many of we have many immune barriers. All of our mucous membranes are immune barriers, but our skin is an immune barrier. We have a blood brain barrier. We have a lung barrier. We have all kinds of barriers. So if these barriers are compromised, then our immune system becomes activated. And then that it's well, it's well documented at this point 
that the gut plays a pivotal role in the immune system and that if you have a problem there and if you can support and get the gut to a, a healthier place, if you can heal the barrier system and get it, get it uh, healthier and to a, uh, a point where it can function more optimally, then you can have a significant impact on the immune system. So if your gut's messed up, if you have imbalanced gut bacteria or dysbiosis, this can further drive the inflammatory process. And then that typically will lead to gastrointestinal symptoms, which are, you know, one of the main, main symptoms reported with long COVID. Okay, so now I want to spend most of the time that we have remaining to discuss potential solutions. And I'm going to give you several different strategies and things to consider. And as always, this is informational in nature. This is not medical advice. Please talk to your doctor before you make any changes. So... What I want to discuss here is how could we support the immune system and what does the evidence show us as potential strategies that may make a difference. And I want to approach this from the functional medicine perspective, which basically is a holistic approach to managing the effects of COVID-19. And, and you know, this is something that I've used personally for the immediate effects whenever I got COVID and when my family did as well and a lot of my clients that I work with, we utilize the combination of herbal strategies, vitamins, rest, diet, you know, a lot of things that just to support an optimal and normal immune response. And, uh, and then I want to also talk about basically longer term, if you have long COVID symptoms, some of the strategies that may be appropriate. Now, this approach and the functional medicine approach is really what you would call a systems biology approach. It's not something uh, that is, it, it is, the best way that I can describe it is that it is trying to look at all the systems of the body to understand how they're interconnected. And like, for example, we just talked about the gut and the importance of the intestinal lining to the immune response. Now, how many of you are aware of that, that the GI tract has a really strong connection to the immune system. Now, if you are, you know, if you're constantly reading things in, you know, about functional medicine or integrative medicine, and you've been, you know, digging and trying to learn things on your own, then you're probably familiar with that concept. But most people, the majority of people are not familiar with this, this strong connection between the gut and the immune system. So what you try to do is you try to understand the interconnectedness of the various systems of the body, how one system can affect another and how everything is basically connected. And, and what that results in is a strategy and an, and an approach where you try to consider as many factors as possible, look at the whole person, look at all the systems of the body, try to understand environmental factors that may be contributing to the expression of disease or of a suboptimal state of health, and how can you change those things? How can you support or optimize those things so that the person can express health and have better health? And this is really the systems biology approach. And it it's really comes down to trying to be a, a better clinician and a better physiologist, trying to understand the chemistry, the immunology, the endocrinology behind, behind the uh, current state of health or, or lack thereof health, and then support that system to get the most optimal outcome possible. That's really what it comes down to. And it's looking at the root causes, like, okay, what is actually driving this process? So let's go ahead and then focus on a few things, a few different categories here. Let's start by talking about nutraceuticals and botanical agents that may be helpful. Now, functional medicine typically will emphasize the use of specific nutraceuticals and and various botanical agents that may have potential antiviral effects. Some of these things will include vitamin D, zinc, and even uh, you've probably heard of quercetin before. It's a, a flavonoid that's found in a lot of different plants, and it has antiviral properties. It's also a zinc ionophore, so it helps to transport zinc. And it really uh, can be, you know, a few of these things can be really helpful uh, with the actual acute viral infection. Things like N-acetylcysteine can also be beneficial. And these things have anti-inflammatory properties. They can help to modulate the immune response. Like, for example, uh, vitamin D is known to have an immune-modulating effect. 
And that means that it, it helps to balance the immune response because your immune response, very simply stated, has a few different parts to it or, or, or a few different um, overall overarching actions. So for one thing, your immune response, if you're infected with something, there is an initial inflammatory response. And then once the, let's say the, the virus is cleared from the body, then the immune system should calm down and there should be a resolution of the inflammation. So there should be an, inflama an inflammatory response and then there should be also an appropriate resolution of that inflammation. And then there should be a return to a baseline where there's not a lot of inflammation present and where the immune system is in a state of surveillance. And that is really one of the things that vitamin D is, is very helpful and critical for because you have to have vitamin D for a particular type of T cell, an immune cell called a regulatory T cell to work normally and to help to orchestrate the immune response. So this is, you know, this is critical. This is where you know, again, some of these nutraceuticals and these herbals can be helpful with just not boosting the immune system, but just making sure that you have what you need so that normal physiology can occur. I mean, that's something that I want to emphasize. You're not trying to create some type of, you know, boost the immune system necessarily, which is when a lot of people talk about, you know, supporting the immune system, they think that they have to like boost it or push it in a particular direction. What I'm talking about is actually trying to help make sure that you have everything that you need for normal immune function to occur, for normal, you know, normal inflammatory response, normal resolution of the of the inflammatory response to occur. So these are some things that that are common, you know, nutraceuticals that can be helpful. Vitamin D, zinc again is 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 really helpful quercetin and then also in acetylcysteine and, and if you're not familiar with in acetylcysteine it's been talked about and it's been in the news a lot over the past you know I'd say few years but it's an antioxidant that helps to support the production of the body's master antioxidant glutathione and this can really help to reduce uh, the inflammatory um, oxidative stress that that can be produced uh, as a result of the inflammatory response. So it can also be something that's very helpful. Now, those are things that, that may be in the short term can be beneficial. I would also say that essential fatty acids are, are really important. And we're talking about here, not, not the acute uh, stage of SARS-CoV-2, but, but potentially if you have like long COVID symptoms and we're dealing with a chronic inflammatory process, we have to try and and try and and make sure that the immune system has everything that it needs to establish, you know, a normal state of inflammation. And what what we're finding and seeing is that a lot of people will have higher inflammatory levels that are persistent. So, you know, this is where vitamin D and zinc, especially these, they're really helpful for immune function. And then quercetin also, you know, I said is is helpful for getting basically a zinc ionophore, getting it into the cells. Uh, N acetylcysteine can be very helpful with glutathione production. These can these can help with uh, the regulatory function of the immune system and and uh, decreasing uh, the inflammation that's present. And so from a from a, a supplementation perspective, I would say that plus maybe uh, fish oil. Uh, I love to utilize fish oil because it has some a lot most people don't have enough omega-3 fatty acids in their diet and they're you know whenever I work with people one-on-one -on -one, we'll typically do some testing to give us a baseline so that we can better understand like what is their vitamin and mineral status what is their essential fatty acid uh, status is there an imbalance in omega-6 fats to omega-3 fats you know what do we need to do to support their body so that normal biochemistry can occur. And so many people are, you know, deficient in in, in their fat soluble vitamins and, and in vitamins and minerals. And a lot of this is because, you know, our our food supply does not contain the same concentration of these things that it used to. Our digestion is often compromised, especially if someone has long COVID. There's there are typically other problems that are per, that are present at the same time as uh, as their symptoms of long COVID like you know, for example, poor GI tract function. And if you cannot assimilate or digest and, and absorb your food, absorb and break down uh, your food properly, then you cannot absorb it into the bloodstream and, you, and you're not, you're going to have deficiencies. You're going to have issues. So, you know, just in general, you know, adding in fish oil to that list is typically something that works well. That's something I take every single day. I'll take about a tablespoon of 
of uh, fish oil every day. I take vitamin D almost every day unless I'm out in the sun. And you always want to, you always want to try to test these things first, right? So that you establish a baseline. That's something I'm definitely an advocate of doing that. I work with people that don't have a budget to get testing sometimes, and that's perfectly fine. You know, based on what's happening with them and then their clinical response, we can often, you know, we can we can often recommend certain supplementation strategies and then see in six weeks or in 12 weeks how they're doing and get a better idea for, uh, you know, the efficacy of our intervention. And, uh, and so these are things that I think are, are really, uh, can be really helpful. And there, there are, listen, there are many other supplements that may be beneficial, but what you want to try to do is focus on diet and lifestyle. The supplementation can be very helpful, but you want to focus on diet and lifestyle because there, most people need to improve diet and lifestyle. And if they do, they can have significant positive impacts on, you know, on their physiology, on their immune response. Now, as far as diet and lifestyle goes, a really foundational aspect of, you know, a functional medicine is the emphasis on diet and lifestyle, because this is where we have a significant amount of disconnect. And I think where we need to be educating the public more on the importance of this, because it's, you know, it's more than just, hey, you need to you get you know seven to eight eight or nine hours of sleep every night. Um, it's more than just that. There's there's it goes much deeper. You, you know your immune system is is intimately connected to to sleep and to many other aspects of your of your of your lifestyle. So some things that you might want to consider doing are uh, number one, consider a diet that is you know and this is kind of generic, but but this is really would be the goal. It would be an anti-inflammatory style of diet. And what, what do I mean by that? I mean, and this is generally for most of the people that I've worked with. And listen, there are many dietary strategies that could be helpful. Even things like carnivore diets, I've seen people do incredibly well with those because it's kind of like a, a really high quality anti-inflammatory uh, type of diet because almost no one reacts to, to meats. But, you know, in general, what I find is that incorporating uh, plants and uh, and fruits and high quality sources of protein into the diet. In, in my clinical experience, and I haven't I haven't utilized carnivore diets, you know, but but I you know just using that as a compare and contrast, the incorporating plants and uh, and their you know of the the colors of the rainbow, so you get a number of different um, a number of different polyphenolic compounds or polyphenols in the diet can be really helpful at increasing the abundance and diversity of your gut bacteria in getting uh, you know more fiber into the diet which you know some people do terrible with with fiber but most of those people they, they are very likely dealing with issues of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and they may not tolerate those fibers well and sometimes they do much better on like a low FODMAP diet where these things are removed from their diet either for a short period of time or sometimes for, you know, a longer period of time, maybe long term. And there can be a lot of reasons that maybe they don't they don't tolerate fibers and that they can't reintroduce them back into their diet. And it gets very complex. And, you know, some people have intestinal autoimmunity where they're they're not able to produce enzymes efficiently and digest these uh, these these fibers and so they, they have like this persistent issue with bacteria overgrowing there are some people that have autoimmunity that is damaging their uh, the the basically the nervous system of the gut and they don't get proper stimulation of their smooth muscle and they don't get the they don't get the the contractions through the intestinal tract that move the food along so that food sits there longer as it's digesting and they get bacterial overgrowth and their, their gut is just not functioning optimally. And there, there may not, you know, quite frankly, sometimes you cannot change that. And, and so, so removing those things from the diet tends to be very helpful for them long term. So in, in my clinical experience though, most people that I work with, they'll do better with some plants, some, you know, some, some food, some fruits, and vegetables, you know, typically root vegetables as well, and high quality sources of protein. And this is usually will will help because it typically has an anti-inflammatory effect because it has this, uh, for one thing, 
usually improves the gut health, the microbiome health, which the gut bacteria, it, it helps to balance those. It helps to, to build their abundance. It helps to um, reduce the number of potentially pathogenic bacteria that might cause uh, other issues. It encourages the growth of bacteria that produce postbiotics or or uh, there as part of the bacterial metabolism, these compounds that actually support the intestinal lining and support the immune system. So an anti-inflammatory diet, which, you know, if I had to like sum it up, I would say fruits, vegetables, some roots, like, like sweet potatoes tend to be great, various types of sweet potatoes, and high quality sources of, uh, of animal-based proteins. That's my personal, uh, that's my personal opinion and experience clinically. Are there other ways to do it? I'm sure there are. I'm sure there are, but what I've seen work well are typically strategies like that. Now, typically removing dairy and most grains from the diet, you know, those are, those are some of the, you know, the key things that, that I would say. Whole foods, eliminate as many processed foods as possible, you know, reduce sh sugar as much as you can, sugar from fruits and, you know, naturally occurring in, in, in whole fruits tend to be okay for people. They, they tend to not cause the same kind of problems. Now, everyone's has their unique situation. Sometimes those, those fruits contain fibers or the fructose can, you know, some people don't digest the fructose well, and it can create issues. And all I can say is like, if you're transitioning to a whole foods diet, that's similar to what I'm describing, if you're trying that and you experience symptoms, you, then you might want to, you know, try to incorporate, maybe you're consuming too much fiber too quickly. And you might want to consider incorporating those things more slowly or you know if you're willing to do it you can follow like a version of like an autoimmune paleo diet which is a, a pretty good template I, i've used that quite a bit and that tends to be a good template uh, to help people but incorporate like an autoimmune paleo diet and pre-cook your foods, like in a slow cook cooker or an Instapot, something like that, an Instant Pot, those can be very helpful and they can help to almost, I mean, when you slow cook things, it pre-digests the foods and it breaks down those fibers more extensively so that they tend to digest more easily. And that can be a good strategy for some people to, to do and follow for, I don't know, it, I see like anywhere from six weeks to 12 weeks, and then they can start incorporating uh, other foods into their diet, but that gives them a chance to really support healing and rebalancing their gut bacteria. I mean, that worked for me. Whenever I was dealing a lot with, with gut issues, I found that like pre-cooking my foods was just a game changer for me. So I'm an advocate of, of using recipes like that, that can be, uh, that can be helpful. Okay. So I've gone drawn to on and on about the anti-inflammatory diet. I would say the next thing would be stress reduction. And stress reduction is such a critical piece of the puzzle too because people don't realize the physiological changes that occur when you're under stress. I mean, chronic stress literally changes your physiology. You can measure it. I mean, you can measure it. Uh, you can measure it uh, based on catecholamines that, that go up like adrenaline. You can measure cortisol. Uh, you can measure heart rate variability, the beats between, between uh, heartbeats. And if those are closer together, that's more... Uh, suggestive of a higher fight or flight response, which is basically activation of your sympathetic nervous system, which is you're driving a stress response. And you can you can actually measure those things physiologically. If you have like a biometrics tracking device, like a smartwatch or a smart ring or something along those lines, you can track it throughout the day and you can actually see what's happening with your with your stress response. And those can be really powerful tools to help you know in real time what your body is doing. And what is your, your current state of stress? So super important things to consider. And this can, you know, prolonged stress can affect, when you have elevated cortisol too, it can affect your ability to produce melatonin. And then that results in issues like you can't sleep well. And then this can also result in weakening the immune system. So things like, you know, identifying the stressors is one of the key things you need to do. Like, you know, am I stressed? Taking in inventory, becoming aware, and then just thinking like, you know, like, contemplate how can I reduce this stressor, like this thing that's driving stress. And, the, and stresses can be emotional stresses. They can be chemical stresses like inflammation, chronic sources of inflammation. Uh, they can be, you know, physical pain can do it. So there's a lot of different potential ways that you can be, you know, you can 
uh, be subjected to stress. So you need to kind of take an inventory first and then think like, what can I do? And some things that can be really helpful are like exercise. I mean, exercise is a fantastic way to help reduce stress. Uh, meditation, deep breathing exercises, you know, yoga is a great way to incorporate stretching and some other things, you know, all at once. So, uh, so, so those are, you know, some good strategies and things to consider when it comes to stress reduction. Sleep is, is a absolutely foundational aspect of your immune system, your immune response, and optimizing your sleep could be one of the most important things that you do. So, you know, that's a really complex topic. There, there are a lot of ways to improve sleep. You know, the, the main thing that, that I like to share with people is establish a routine, go to bed at the same time and wake up at the same time. And, you know, I'm sorry if this sounds boring to you, but if you're dealing with chronic health issues, I mean, what, what are we going to do? Like, I mean, if you're, if you're not willing to like at least try for six weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks to follow a routine, then how, you, you know, and, and if let's say it's an option, you just don't want to do it. Okay. Now I realize some people don't have the option where they're working, you know, shifts that change and they have all these other life demands and then they can't just, you know, at the, you know, drop of a dime change their lifestyle. I, I get that there are constraints that, you know, that, that people are, um, it, they, they face that others don't. And, uh, you know, we, we have to be more creative in those cases. But if you're someone that is, it's just like, I want to stay up and watch TV or do this or do that, then how, you know, how serious are you about trying to improve the symptoms that you're having? Because you, you're going to have to make some change. You know, that that's a challenge. I, mean, I get it, you know, making change and, and actually being able to implement, you know, strategies that, that are, that are important, that, that are, you know, probably critical for you to improve your health can be really difficult to do because making change is not easy for, for anyone, but you have to, that's why you have to, you have to have reasons, right? So what I like to do is when I start working with people, I like to have them write down five reasons why they want to change their life. Like, why are, why are we even talking? Why are you even listening to this podcast? What, you know, what is, what are you trying to get out of, you know, out of, learning more about your health or changing your health. What, why is that important to you? And for a lot of people, it's like, you know, they can't function. They can't carry out their day-to-day -day activities. They can't be there for their family members. They can't, they, you know, they, there's all these things that they cannot do in their life because their health is, is in the way. And, and I'm like, okay, well, we'll acknowledge those things, write those things down. And then every time you, you think that you can't do it or you lack motivation, go back to those things and look at those reasons and you know have a reason why and that's that's really that's really important because it's it's easy sometimes to quit and and this is not you know quite frankly what i'm going to share with you is not that hard and when you start feeling better that is reinforcing and on its own you know you feel better you're more motivated to do things you're more more motivated to stick with it because it transforms your life so going to bed at the same time waking up at the same time every day setting a routine you know, minimum of, you know, most of the people that I work with need at least eight hours of sleep. A lot of them don't, uh, you know, you know, haven't been getting that, but they need at least eight. Some of the people I work with that are autoimmune, they even need nine or 10 hours initially, initially, not always, but, but they need nine or 10 hours initially. And what you'll find is, is if you start establishing a routine where you go to bed at the same time, you know, and, and then you, you'll find that you wake up without an alarm clock. Like your body just wakes up, you don't need an alarm clock. And that's what I like to use an app called Sleep Cycle. And they're not sponsoring me or, or any of that. That's just what I've used. I looked at it this morning. I've used Sleep Cycle for seven years. I have seven years of data every night, going to bed, waking up. Uh, and it's been fantastic for me. It's one of the you know cheapest, best ways to to track your sleep and your health. And, and it's a fantastic thing, especially with sleep being such a critical aspect of, of our health. So going to bed and waking up at the same time, uh, having a cool enough environment. So typically, you know, for me, I like to sleep with it cooler. So I like minimum of like 68 uh, or a maximum, I should say, temperature of like 68 degrees. I could sleep in much cooler weather. But if it gets much warmer than that, I will tend to be um, to be hot. So I will oftentimes sleep with just a sheet on or sometimes with nothing. And so some people think that they can't they can't do that. Listen, I get it. I'm not like the, gold, the, the, the bar or the gold standard by any means. But um, whatever's comfortable to you, you know, uh, I would say. But typically cooler is better. And then, you know, if you can eliminate all light from the room, that's ideal. If you can eliminate the noise, you know, 
cut out any any noises unless it's some type of like background no noise like a sound machine or or an air filter or something that you have that's running that kind of creates this um, you know this background noise it's easy to kind of tune out and just you know lull you to sleep that's fine doing something like that's typically fine and by the way the the sleep cycle app that I use measures the light in the background and it also measures sound so it will it will tell you there's a recording it, it, it reports it every night and uh, it's fantastic so it can help you to identify some of these potential issues and one of the things I like that they've added more recently is is the recording of sound so if you're snoring or if you're coughing or if something's happening in the night that's waking you up that you're unaware of it's gonna pick it up and then you can listen to it the next day so it's it's awesome for, for that. I mean, that's absolutely something that none of the other health trackers have. So you can have a watch or a smart ring or whatever that's measuring your sleep at night, which I recommend you use one or both of those in addition to the sleep cycle app, but it will record you. And so many people snore and they have no idea what's actually happening and how many times, excuse me, how many times that happens throughout the night, which is, which is a huge you know, it's a huge oversight. It's a huge problem. There are so many people with sleep issues. That is one of the number one things you have to fix. And if you will fix that, I promise you, it can be a transformative experience for your life, but also for your immune system and your health. So if you're dealing with like long COVID and you're not sleeping well, that is one place to really, really focus your effort. And if you are snoring and you're having other issues sleeping at night, then you absolutely 100% need to talk to your doctor about getting a sleep study done because if you need a CPAP or some 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 uh, kind of assistance to sleep well that's what you need to do that's absolutely what you need to do because it is such a critical component of your health and you will feel awful and you won't even know why you won't even know why you feel bad so okay let's move on to the next thing uh, gut health which we talked about you know it is absolutely critical it plays such an important role in your overall health and your immune function and so things like when you're talking about the gut, the diet is so helpful and such an important thing to get right. I mean, what you're eating is is absolutely critical to a healthy gut. It's just it's just so important. A lot of people ask me about probiotics and prebiotics and postbiotics, and they can be really helpful um, because they can help to, you know, put bacteria or food for bacteria, which is prebiotics or the the um, postbiotics, which are the things that a lot of the good bacteria produce, like butyrate, short chain fatty acid, you can those can you can supply your body, take those as a supplement, supply your gut with those things, and a lot of times they will help to rebalance the gut, get the intestinal lining healthier, and get you started on a path to you know restore better gut microbiome and gut health, and you don't necessarily have to continue taking those things forever. That's an important thing to understand is that the supplementation really is a tool, and some people need to take some supplements long term to some degree. I mean, I do, but not everything. You don't need to be on this huge protocol of 30 supplements. That is that is not, that that is, I've never seen that be uh, what is, you know, optimal for health. So just keep that in mind. Focus on diet. Uh, dietary fiber is also something that's critical for gut health. So consuming a diet that's rich in fiber can really help to support the gut health and feed those bacteria. And that can help to reduce inflammation. Now, again, some people are going to have all kinds of trouble with, with fibers. So you have to start slow when you're, when you're introducing fiber into the diet, and then you can gradually increase it. And if you can't tolerate you know, fiber because it causes all kinds of bloating and distension, you may want to look into why that's occurring. And there are a lot of people that have, you know, there's a, a lot of different problems. They have poor, you know, low stomach acidity, poor, uh, poor digestive enzyme uh, sufficiency. They have intestinal autoimmunity. They have uh, their enteric, their uh, nervous system of their gut is, been, is damaged because of autoimmunity. And they don't have good, good peristalsis or, or activity of the digestive tract. So their food and their transit time is, the, the time it takes for their stool to pass through is lengthened significantly, causing you know, fermentation, overgrowth of these bacteria. And, and then they, they get all of these symptoms and, and those fibers just tend to feed those, those bad bacteria. And there can be you know, a number of issues that are present that cause someone to have long-term digestive problems. And so sometimes you have to modify the diet. You know, I've worked with a lot of people that they have these digestive problems, 
you know, we identify to some degree like what, what exactly is happening. It's tricky to figure out. Then they'll use antimicrobials. The like so let's say herbal things that, that kill off bacteria, those bacteria will die down and their symptoms will improve and then they'll come back. And then they'll use antimicrobials and they'll die down and then they'll come back. And then they'll use antimicrobials and they'll come back. And what ends up happening is there, there's this cycle that's classic for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And guess what? Sometimes you you cannot you cannot fix that. No matter how many antibiotics are prescribed, no matter how many antimicrobials you take, because there is a problem. There's a problem with the uh, enteric plexus, the, the nerves that, that stimulate the gut. There can be intestinal autoimmunity. There, intestinal autoimmunity, there can be intestinal uh, nervous system autoimmunity. There can be a lot of issues that are preventing the gut from, from being healthy. So some people follow like a low FODMAP diet, which removes FODMAP as an acronym for certain types of fibers. And when they remove those fibers, they tend to have you know, less bloating and they feel better. So they just keep a lot of those fibers out. Now, is that optimal for human health? Well, we don't know, but we know that symptomatically that tends to help them. Is that going to decrease their diversity of bacteria in their gut? Maybe it, it, it definitely uh, could. So, the, I mean, again, it's where you look at a lot of the strategies that you use. I mean, everyone's different. Everyone has different problems. So it's, it's very difficult to say with certainty what is absolutely the correct answer? Because no one knows for sure. But we know that uh, certain fibers and things can tend to contr contribute to that. And that's why, I mean, you'll see people that are following like carnivore diets, for example, where they're eating nothing but meat. The, it, their health seems to be, you know, a lot of these people seem to have health transformed. Now, is that going to create some problems for people? Well, maybe. It depends on the individual, I would say. But, I mean, it's just like, you know, eating a bunch of fiber and doing, you know, a lot of the things um, – that are classically believed, or, or I would say even not classically, but that are, you know, that, that like my personal beliefs about what is probably the, the most ideal diet, it's going to be different. It's different. It's different for everyone. So, you know, I would say when I work with people, I lean more towards high quality animal based proteins as a real significant cornerstone of the diet, good, healthy fats, and then fruits and, uh, and, vegetables with the colors of the rainbow because that's going to give you different polyphenols and compounds that feed different types of bacteria that te that seems to be a really good strategy but it, it really also depends on the person you know on, on exactly what i'd recommend but that's kind of the dietary strategy that i follow now i enjoy eating those foods i seem to be you know feel good when i eat those foods if i felt terrible i would i would consider a different way and uh, and i would look into other strategies so so, you know, I would say be careful with your certainty around a particular dietary strategy as being the only way to do things because I don't think that's true. Though I think, uh, you know, there uh, a lot of people, there, there's a lot of variety in the human population and uh, or variability amongst us. So we have to, yeah, you have to appreciate the difference from one person to the next. So... You know, these are all things that I think can be helpful. But taking taking an integrative approach to this, I think, is is important. So, you know, seeing your doctor, seeing a cardiologist, making sure that you know you're getting your heart checked and and screened is a critical component to you know making sure that you don't have you know a risk factor for you know heart attacks or strokes. And if you do, you know, take the medical management seriously and 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 work with your doctor and then consider incorporating these dietary and lifestyle aspects that I'm discussing here because they can be real game changers. They can they can have a modulating effect on the inflammatory response and you know on your health that you're not going to get any other way really. I mean you, you're going to get benefits from changing your diet, changing your lifestyle, you know, exercise as well which I haven't really gone into, but doing these things from a dietary and lifestyle perspective are going going to be able to pull levers that affect your health in ways that no medication is going to affect. Okay. And so an integrative approach that, that takes into consideration your, you know, the, the, the knowledge and, and, and information that we have from modern medicine and the, you know, this, this approach from a systems biology perspective, from a functional medicine perspective and blending these together, I think makes the most sense. So it's all about 
you know, a personalized approach for the individual person and tailoring the diet, tailoring the, you know, the, the lifestyle uh, modifications to you based on the things that are most likely, you know, the, the gaps or the, or, or the things that are being overlooked or, uh, or the triggers that are identified based on your unique situation, I think are critical. So I think, you know, in conclusion, since I have drawn on about this, hopefully uh, it makes some sense. Uh, but, you know, sometimes I get into these podcasts and I just start, you know, thinking out loud and I should probably be following my outline a bit more. But overall, what I would suggest here and what I wanted to highlight was that COVID-19 and these these effects, these side effects can just be, you know, it's, it's a... It can be, it can be overwhelming because it seems like every every month or so we're we're, we're getting new information about potential side effects from COVID nineteen uh, from the SARS CoV two virus, and I think that the best thing that we can do is just focus on optimizing our health, and by you know understanding this interconnectedness of the systems of our body and how everything works together, and by addressing and supporting each of these systems, we can you know, we can better support and optimize our health and be more resilient to these problems. If you found this episode helpful, please share and leave a review. It really helps the podcast. And as always, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. You can also follow us on YouTube and Facebook at the office of Dr. Brad Shook. You can join our Facebook group, the Greater Hickory Thyroid Support Group with over 11,000 members. And you can find me on Instagram at Dr. Brad Shook. And remember, together, we can make a difference. Okay, so I have gone on and on. Uh, hopefully, it's not totally incoherent. But the main thing to take away here is is just remember that there's a lot that you can do to support this inflammatory process and a lot of these side effects. And it revolves around dietary changes, lifestyle changes, and there are a lot of nutraceuticals and herbals and things out there that can support your physiology, support uh, healing of the body and help you to, you know, restore and bring yourself back into a more optimal state of health. And when you incorporate modern medicine with, you know, really what I would call functional medicine, a common sense approach, get healthy, how to get you healthy, look and look at and survey your, your, what's going on with your body, work with someone that can help you to identify these gaps that you may not be aware of, ways that you can, things that you can currently, that you're currently doing that may be detrimental to your health or uh, things that you might be missing that you should be utilizing to help support your health. Work with someone to help you set a baseline and and help you to uh, get on a structured plan to try and support your health. And then from there, you can do a reassessment and you can work through optimizing your health, getting yourself healthier, and working on a lot of the underlying causes of the symptoms that we see and the physiology that's associated with long COVID. So want to keep you guys informed, help you to live the best quality of life possible. And I appreciate you joining me today, hanging out when I drawn on about, you know, whatever. But until next time, keep thriving, keep smiling, Reach out to us if you need anything, and I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful day. Thanks so much for listening. We hope you enjoyed hanging out behind the scenes with Dr. Shook. You can also talk with and learn from Dr. Shook through Facebook Live on our Facebook page at the office of Dr. Brad Shook. Don't forget, you can also get access to our videos, guidebooks, and thyroid programs at www.drbradshook.com. Oh yeah, and don't forget one more thing. We can change the world one person, one family, and one community at a time. Until next time, remember, today is your day, and no one will tell you who you are and what you can be.